All right, so um, people who are watching this live, welcome. People who are watching this in the future, also welcome to this little hearing glass live special where I'm going to be creating this 3D maze generation algorithm thingy using Jitter. Um, now, this is something I've already done. I even made a little promo video to it to kind of brag that I can uh, kind of create something like this. And this is what we want to create, right? So this grid that is eventually processed using some algorithm into, yeah, creating this maze, creating this little labyrinth. And if we have time, I'm not sure if we are going to have time, we can also see how to make this happen. So kind of see how we can traverse through this little maze that we have created. But more specifically, I want to focus on this side of things. So how to create this grid and how to use a maze generation algorithm in order to make this happen. Right, so I'm doing this live because honestly it's easier for me that I don't have to worry about uh, me coughing or having to drink something and you know that I can just shoot this live, look at some questions on the chat and have a really nice video at the end. Now, when I'm doing this, I'm going to be, as I've said, be focusing on the jitter side of things, right? So essentially, I'm going to create a 3D world, I'm going to create that grid and then I'm going to see how do I create and apply that very specific maze generation algorithm. And to set up my 3D scene, I'm actually going to use this uh, user snippets feature, right? You can go to right click, paste from user snippets. And if you have saved a user snippet, you can choose that. And it's just going to paste a specific group of objects into your max window. If you haven't, this is what my normal setup is when I'm dealing with 3D stuff. I got my JIT.worlds, I got my FPS GUI, I got my S Metro, so the send object, which is going to send one bang per frame render. And I got this little camera here, right? With these very specific attributes, position, look at, tripod, lock, look, and it's connected to, or JIT Anim Drive is connected to this JIT GL camera, and JIT Anim Drive has the attributes of UI listen and speed. And by making sure I sent the message anim underscore reset to both of these guys when I press space, so key detects key presses, it selects 32 aka spacebar, and it sends this message to these two guys to kind of reset the camera. And this is my regular setup, right? If I start this jit.worlds, and if I, let's say, generate a random object, like jit gl grid shape, uh, Let's give it the shape attribute of plane because we are going to be working with planes. You can see that I can use my WASD keys to kind of move around. So in this case, the object itself isn't moving, but the camera is it's kind of rotating around this center point of zero, zero, zero. All right, so this is my beginning point for making this nice little maze. Now, I have to give credit to where credit is due. This is something I've actually, well, not ripped off, but inspired by this guy right here, who is the patron saint of, uh, of creative coding. You know, the one and only coding train did make this coding challenge many years ago. My God, how, how long ago was 2016 now? Is it, let me think, five, six, seven years ago or so? My God, time is passing. You know, Mr. Coding Train here looks so so young and full of hope, as we all were in the year 2016. Anyway, so in the year 2016, the uh, Coding Challenge, the number 10.1, Maze Generator with P5.js. I do recommend that you check out this video because it's really cool if you know how to work with JavaScript or uh, P5.js or processing, you can really see the logic behind creating such a maze. And the most important thing about this challenge and how this maze is structured is the fact that it's a grid-based system, right? You can see all these little squares and uh, rectangles that kind of make up this grid here and each step that we take in our maze is, you know, moving to the right, left or up or down in this grid-based system. Now, this is fantastic for us because there is a very easy way of dealing with grid-based data systems in Jitter. The Jitter matrix, right? The jits.matrix is a data type, a matrix that can be a 2D grid or it can be represented as a 2D grid. So if I create, let's say, a jitter matrix with four planes, the float 32 data type, and if I make this, I don't know, 10 by 10, right, I can actually visualize this grid by using jit.cellblock. So I can 
kind of zoom out here, send my matrix to jit.cell block, send the bank to jit matrix. Now look at this, we are representing all of this data in a 2D grid. Now, one problem with a jitter matrix is the fact that all data is represented as numbers, right? So we can't really input positions or states or complex objects or things like that. We really have to make sure that everything is represented as data. But this can be a great starting point. We can try to visualize a 10 by 10 grids in our 3D world by using the, this little plane right here before we go into con you know thinking about walls and mazes and algorithms that make that possible. Now it's not a coincidence that I've created this plane shape here because the plane shape is going to be our bread and butter. When we are creating our when we're creating our maze we have to think of this plane shape. We have to think of it as a little brick as the tiniest element in our world. Right, uh, so uh, yes, Cameron X, uh, JXYZ, yeah, I, I am doing the 90s screensaver challenge, uh, kind of trying to recreate what I've already done while trying to explain how it works. Anyway, so the plane uh, shape is what we need. But even before I think about using it as walls and removing those walls, I just want to display this matrix in such a way that each cell in my matrix is going to be equal to a single plane right here. And this is where JITGL multiple is going to come in handy. So I can create a JITGL multiple and I'm not going to give it any arguments or anything because I'm just creating this for showcasing purposes right now, because I want you to think about the fact that how complex things would be if I really tried to create a single JIT GL grid shape with the attribute of shape plane for each cell here. I have a 10 by 10 matrix, so this would mean that I would need, well, let's see, at least 100 of these guys. I would need to copy and paste this 100 times and then try to tweak around its position and rotation and color and all of those attributes independently, which is not something that I want to do. And instead, I'm going to be using JITGL multiple here, right? And I have done a quite a number of videos on JITGL multiple, but just to go over how it works, JITGL multiple will create instances of a 3D shape. If I connect JITGL multiple to JITGL grid shape, my object will disappear because now JITGL multiple will decide how many of this 3D object will appear in my 3D world and at which positions, at which color, which rotation, uh, in which size, and so on. But for this to work, and I'm going to kind of remove this so I get my little plane back here as I'm explaining things. In order for this to work, I need to tell JITGL multiple a few things. So first of all, I need to tell it how many parameters of this 3D shape I will be controlling. So how many uh, different attributes of this JITGL grid shape 3D object I will be controlling for each instance of my generated 3D shape through JITGL multiple. And in this case, I'm well, I'm going to change the position, of course, right? Each plane is hopefully at a different location, so they are not overlapping. I would like to change the color because, well, why not? We can give each plane a different color so we can differentiate between them. And I am going to do the, let's see, rotate X, Y, Z, which is a really useful message. In fact, I would like to showcase it right now. If I say pack rotate X, Y, Z, zero, 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 so kind of format a message that begins with rotate X, Y, Z. I can actually define rotation. I can rotate this object along the X, Y, and Z axes. So for example, if I rotate it along the X axis, you can see it's kind of flipping and turning in this way. If instead I rotate it along the Y axis, it's kind of rotating around the Y axis. And if I do it on the Z axis, it's going to start rotating in this way clockwise or counterclockwise, and all of these values are going to be in degrees, right, from so 0 to 90 degrees, and so on, and so on. And this is not something I want to deal with while I create this object, right? So when I create my JITGL grid shape, I'm not thinking about the rotation, but I'm saying when I create multiple instances of this plane, I am going to be rotating them differently. 
why we are going to see in a second, but long story short is to create walls. Okay, so this is going to be my argument. So JIT's gel multiple three, as I'm going to be controlling three parameters. Well, actually, let's make that four because I also want to control the scale as well. Like the scale is the size of the object. I want to control that too. So JIT GL multiple four, and then I need to give it the attribute GL params, and I need to describe the individual parameters of this 3D object I will be controlling. So position, color, rotate, X, Y, Z, and last but not least, scale. Okay, so now if I connect the outlet of JIT GL multiple to the inlet of JIT GL grid shape, you'll see that my plane has disappeared because as I've said a few minutes ago, that now JGL multiple is controlling the visualization of my plane. And it's going to be looking at these inlets to decide the position, that's the first inlet, the color, that's the second inlet, the rotate X, Y, Z, so the rotation, that's the third inlet, and the scale of each individual instance. And how do we decide how many instances we make of this 3D shape? Well, we are just going to be using jitter matrices, matrices, right? So jit.matrix. Let's give it four planes. So each cell is going to have four pieces of data associated with it. It's going to be the float 32 data type. And it's again going to be 10 by 10. So I can also visualize this just like I did before using this jit.cell block. So it can go here to visualize the contents and also to my JIT GL multiple. Now if I bang this, again, I'm not going to have anything appear on my screen. And that's because, well, first of all, I have not filled all of the inlets for JIT GL multiple to work. It needs to receive information in all of its inlets. So it really knows the scale and rotation and color and position of each instance of the 3D object that is creating. But we can already see what is going on in JIT.cell block. We can even use the plane minus one comma call width 120. If I send this message, you'll see, I can kind of see what is in each cell of this jitter matrix and well, it's a bunch of zero. So it's nothing really too interesting here, right? It's a, it's a jitter matrix I have just created. So of course it has zero of everything. Each cell has a value of zero across all four planes. But this is our starting point, and how I'm going to work with this is through JITGen. So I'm going to create JITGen. I'm going to put my matrix into JITGen, and inside JITGen I'm going to do a bunch of cool stuff that's going to have four outputs. So it's going to spit out four different jitter matrices, one for each inlet of JITGL multiple. Which means the first outlet will be controlling the position. The second outlet is going to be controlling the color. You can even write this, right? It's always nice to, it's always nice to have comments around. So if you're looking at this months later, you can kind of have an idea on what you intended to do before everything went wrong and nothing works anymore. And here you are months later trying to figure out what exactly went wrong. But we are not there yet, so I'm going to just write some comments for that future desperate self of mine. So rotate X, Y, Z and scale. All right, so all right, how are we going to work with this? Well, first of all, I'm going to give color a random value. So I'm going to use the noise operator in JITGen, which is going to give me a random value between zero and one for all planes. This is going to be the color. I don't want this to rotate right now. I want all of my planes to be in the same position. So I'm going to use the VEC operator. So kind of creating this message. So VEC 0, 0, 0. So zero rotation on all three axes. And the scale, I want it to be one, right? So scale is going to be one, 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 AKA the regular size when you create this JITGL grid shape plane, it is the size that it's going to have. Now, the only problem is the position. How are we going to figure out how these planes need to be positioned for it to be a perfect grid? And before we get into that, let's try to figure out how to visualize this all actually. So for now, I'm going to use the cell operator inside JetChat. And the cell operator, well, it gives you the cell coordinates of the input matrix. So for each cell here, it's going to give two values. 
right? Uh, the X and the Y coordinate of the cell in the matrix, as in the top left cell is going to be 0, 0, then 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, 4, 0, and so on. And if I'm going in the vertical direction, it's going to be 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, again, and so on. So I can kind of turn this into a position message for, for my instances. I'm going to, nope, not Swiss x, c, x, but Swiss x and Swiss y to kind of take apart those two values that are going to come out of cell. I'm going to pack those into a vector with, again, three values, right? The first one is going to be the position on the x-axis, the second one on the y-axis, and the third one on the z-axis, which is going to be zero because I'm not really working with depth here. And that's going to be my position matrix. Okay, I wonder how this is going to look. Well, I need to make sure that the output of my JITGEN really matches the inlets of JITGEL multiple, and then I can click this. Okay, so we are getting something. It's really huge grid, and it does look a bit greedy. <laughs> it does look a bit gritty, as in there are these overlapping planes, and it does resemble a grid, but... And I'm just taking a sip from my water. <clears throat> For dramatic pause here but you might notice two things so first of all it's kind of on the top right so it's not centered well I know this because my camera is centered so if something's not centered here it means that it's not centered and two while there is this gritty look here I see that they are kind of overlapping a bit too much or right, you can see this is the size of my grid and then when it's going one to the right it's actually kind of overlapping with the previous one and so on and so on. So there is definitely a problem here. And the problem then is, well, the position. So this kind of position that we are working with, so 0, 1, 2, 3, for the x and y axis is not doing the trick for us. It's not doing the job for us. And maybe I can hop over to my good old paints to explain why this is, <clears throat> right? Because if we are going to be thinking about overlapping rectangles and why they're overlapping well we have to really consider their coordinates and their sizes their lengths and uh, yeah their widths so let's think of it like this i'm going to delete this happy face here for some reason i can't all right let's let's draw it back in then as i'm drawing things so let's imagine that we have this nice square here right this is our plane and it is at the zero 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 position Great. Now, here's the source of our problem. The scale of this guy is 1, right? So the size, let's write scale. Scale equals 1. This is going to be the case for all of our plates. Um, for those of you asking in the chat, of course, this will be recorded. Uh, if you're watching this in the future, you know that this is recorded, but I needed to say this to the people watching this live. All right, so the size of this is going to be 1, but that does not mean that the width of this plane is 1. In fact, the width of this plane is 2, 2 units, 2 meters or 2 feet or 2 kilometers or 2 nanometers. doesn't matter how you think. If uh, we, have, we are counting things by units of something, then this is going to be 2 units. And the same thing with the other dimension, it is going to be 2 units tall. And now, if you're good at this kind of things, you will notice that that is the problem here, right? Because each time I'm setting the position of a cell, well, I'm taking its cell position, which means it's incrementing by one. So I have my first cell here, I have my first plane here. And for the second one, I'm going one to the right. Or so I'm kind of going one unit to the right, meaning that this will be the center point for the second plane. As in, it's going to be like this. Well, that was horrible squared. Let's write like this. It's going to be like this. There will be this overlapping part. And again, this is something we do not really want, right? What I want is in fact this, a perfectly aligned plane right here. So the center point would be here. And in our coordinate system, this would have a coordinate of two, zero, zero, so two on the x-axis, not one, but two is going to make sure this fits perfectly. And the same thing is of course true on the y-axis, right? So if I want something here, 
I would need to go two down as I need to increment twice on the y-axis, which means that this plane would have the coordinate of 0, minus 2, 0. And this is how we need to think of these things. Right, so each time I need to increment by 2, not 1, to find the position of the next plane. And this doesn't matter if I have 4 planes or 500,000 planes, I need to use this logic to find the position of each plane. Now, this is fairly easy to take care of in our current system because I essentially want to take the series of uh, you know, 0, 1, 2, 3, and I want this to turn into 0, 2, 4, 6, etc. Now, if you have a PhD degree in mathematics, like I don't, uh, you will notice that the second one, so this second set of numbers, is the first set of numbers multiplied by 2. So if I take my cell coordinates and if I multiply them by 2 before I kind of figure out its position, I pack those into a vector, I should have perfect non-overlapping planes. So I can just do this, plug it into cell, click this again, and there we go. Now we have a perfect grid of planes. They are not overlapping, but they are touching each other in a perfect way, in such a way that it fits together and it looks like that this giant board has been split into 10 by 10 cells, which is again exactly what we want. But what we don't want is the fact that this is not centered, right? Because again, my camera is pointing at the center, so if this is on the top right, uh, then it is on the top right and it is not centered. And of course this is happening because we are using a uh, co coordinate system where 0, 0 is the middle, so I would need to dip into the negative numbers. Negative coordinates if I want to go left or if I want to go down. Now we can think of all the complicated mathematics that will make this possible, but again I'm going to refer to my favorite object, or in this case operator in Max MSP, which is the scale operator. Right, and as you might know, scale works by taking four values, an input range and an output range. So I should be able to say, all right, my incoming cell coordinates has the values of, let's see, they have values between 0 and 9. Right, so there are 10 cells, but we start counting from 0. So we have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 0 until 9. This is going to be my input. And I kind of want this to perfectly center itself in the middle. Which means, let's see if I have this right, the output range should be between minus 4.5 to 4.5. Right, so the half of 9, the half of my range goes to the left and half of it goes to the right. I think I have this... Correct. Let's see. So my cell coordinates come in, they get scaled in such a way that it's going to be centered, and then they go through this operation. Yes, perfect. Look at this. When I do this, when I zoom out, you can see that this is centered perfectly. Now we have a perfectly centered grid, which is great. So we have our jitter matrix. Uh, it's 10 by 10. It's going through this jit gen to generate some values. It's going into JITGR multiple which is using this plane shape to kind of visualize each cell as a plane, which currently has random colors, which is also nice. It's a nice little disco ball or a disco plane, disco grid, disco soon to be maze, disco labyrinth, doesn't matter, but we have our starting point. Now you will notice that this does not really look like a maze nor a labyrinth. It's very flat, it's essentially a bunch of grids right now. But again, this is the starting point that we want. Because if I go back to my, my beloved coding tray, and if I look at this image that he's working with here, you'll notice that he does have all these grids, but he also has all of these voles, these bunch of voles. Each grid is surrounded by four voles. And that is something I can try to create in my current system, right? I can take this grid and I can try to make sure that each grid, each plane here, is surrounded by walls, which I can again represent by using even more planes. The only question is, where are my walls going to be? Where are they going to stand? So let's go back to my horrible, horrible paint window, and I'm going to reload this. So uh, 
kind of see how it works. So we can figure out where we need to place our volts. All right, so let's again imagine that this is our central plane, right? So it's a plane that has a position 0, 0, 0. Now, one way to make a wall is to create another plane right on top of it and then rotate it, just like I've shown you at the beginning, on either on the x or y axis, which is going to give us a, uh, a plane that is rotated in such a way that it resembles a wall. All right, so let's say I'm rotating it on the x axis, so it's kind of being rotated like this. This is very tough to visualize on a 2D uh, paint.js.org window, but I'm doing my best here. So if I rotate this plane on the x-axis, then it's kind of going to look like this, right? So I'm looking at this plane from the top now, and I can kind of try and place it here so it becomes a vol. I can again rotate this on the y-axis. I can create a plane and rotate it on the y-axis and then move it in such a way that it lands here. So there is a vol here, and I can create two more planes so they kind of cover my original plane, right? My original grid cell, so it is being covered by these four walls. If this doesn't make sense to you, don't worry. I mean, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me as I'm explaining it, but you're going to see in a second how this exactly works. Right, so let's consider this. I'm going to create another JIT GL multiple. So for now, I'm going to delete this jit.cell block, and I'm going to create the same jit.gl multiple object. Right, so add gl params, position, color, rotate, x, y, z, and scale. Now the fun thing with jit.gl multiple is that we can actually attach it to the same jit.gl grid shape, right? So the same jit.gl grid shape can be used as the source shape for multiple jit.gl multiple objects. I think if we want, we can even take a JGL multiple and connect it to a JGL multiple, so kind of multiplying the multiplication, but we are not going that crazy yet. But that might happen. That is technically possible. Now, what I want is to copy the exact same JGL, connect it in the same way. Oops, I forgot the little argument of four here. I want to connect this in the exact same way. And I want the same JIT matrix to trigger the same process with this secondary JITGL multiple. So now what is going to happen when I click this? Well, seemingly nothing, right? Actually, we are getting two grids right now. They're overlapping each other perfectly, but they all seem to be uh, in the right place. They have their random colors. That is nice. But that means I can now do something really interesting. I can open my seconds. Jet gen, right? The second jet gen connected to the second jet gel multiple. And I can start messing with this rotation here. So what did I say? I, I want to create walls and let's see, let's say I want to start with this upper wall, right? Which means I need to rotate this plane on the x-axis by 90 degrees. Right? So this is my rotation vector. And I can say 90, 0, 0 instead of 0, 0, 0, meaning rotated 90 degrees on the x-axis, 0 on the y-axis, 0 on the z-axis. Now let's see what's going to happen. All right, so something, as you can see, is taking place. Now each plane in my second grid is rotated by 90 degrees, so it's intersecting my original grid in this interesting way. This is already a very interesting pattern. If you are trying to create something visual, this might be a cool starting point for it. But for us, this is one of our first four volts. We only have one problem, as I have been describing it in my horrible Paint.js Chrome tab. It's centered, right? I want it to be here, but it's kind of at the center of the plane. So each upper wall, in this case, is at the center of the plane. And this is something I can easily fix by adding an offset to each plane here. So let's say I'm getting my cell, I'm scaling it, I'm multiplying, multiplying it by two, and then I'm getting its x and y components, which I then pack into an x, y, z vector. Why don't I just, let's see, why don't I add one to whatever the y coordinate is? What would happen if I do this? So now I'm taking the same coordinates, but 
I'm adding one to each y coordinates. Ah, there you go. So now this is essentially perfect, right? The walls are all on the top of the plane that I create. So each cell now has a single wall on the top. Now, this is how I'm going to work, right? So I'm going to need three more of these GGL multiples. And each of these are going to represent a single wall or a single side of the wall of the cells, right? So this is going to be the top one. This is going to be the right one. This is going to be the bottom one. And this is going to be the left one. Let's also write these. So top wall and then right wall and then bottom wall. And finally, last but not least, we have left wall. All right, and this can be your floor, I guess. No need to get rid of this for no reason. All right, so how are we going to do this? Well, I can, again, connect the same JIT matrix to all of these guys, and I can also connect the JIT GL multiples to the same grid shape, since they're all going to be dealing with planes. The only difference is going to be the JIT gen. So each JIT gen of a wall is going to have some different parameters to make sure they are rotated correctly and that they're on the right side. For example, if I take my right wall, well, what do I want? I want my right wall to be rotated in a different way. It needs to rotate along the y-axis and not on the x-axis, right? So I need to, instead of 90, 0, 0, I need to say 0, 90, 0. Let's see how this looks. Yep, we have our right wall, but they're again centered, so I can go back here and I can say, instead of going one up on the y-axis, go one up on the x-axis. Of course, if on the x-axis we increment the x-coordinate, the x-position by one, it means we are going one unit to the right. And guess what? That is exactly what we need. So as you can see, we are kind of beginning to create our vault grid shape right now. And because these are kind of touching along the borders, it already looks perfect, but right now we don't have our left and down walls, and those are going to be essential once we actually get started with the maze generation algorithm. So let's do the bottom wall. So that's going to be the exact same thing as the top wall, but instead of incrementing the Y coordinate by one, I'm just going to subtract one from it, which means instead of going one up, I'm going to go one down. You can see in our initial row of cells here, we are getting this bottom wall. And for the left wall, it's the same thing. I'm going to rotate it 90 degrees on the y-axis. And again, instead of adding one to the x-coordinate, I'm going to subtract one from the x-coordinate, meaning I'm going to go one unit to the left. Boom, there we go. Okay, so we got our voles, we got our plane. We got actually a bunch of planes. How many planes do we got now? Let me think. Uh, so it's 10 by 10. So each JGL multiple is rendering 100 planes. And I have five of them, four walls and the ground. So this would be 500 planes. Okay, so 500 planes are being rendered 60 times per second. Or, well, it's less than 60 because I'm also streaming this. So my GPU is begging me for mercy. But that's, of course, not really happening. But still, this is a very good excuse for me to refill my water bottle and get a little sip from it before I continue with this. <clears throat> ah, fantastic. One more thing I see here is the fact that the planes, so the floor planes, are also kind of in the middle. So I would like them to be a bit lower. And that is taking place on the z-axis, right? So if I go to my floor jet gen, and here, if I say vec 0, 0, minus, no, 0, 0, 1, does this make sense? Nope. If I say vec 0, 0, minus 1, <clears throat> then those floor planes are going to be rendered one unit farther than normal, so they're going to be really at the bottom here. Okay, so we have generated... <laughs> Exactly, Cameron, we have to... Hydration is very important when you're working with Max MSP because you can get a bit too sucked into it, and that's, that's no good. You don't want to be dehydrated. 
But that also reminds me to save my thing, so I'm all about healthy habits right now. I need to make sure I drink my water, I need to make sure I regularly save all of my max patches. So what shall I call this? I'm going to call this live stream 3 because this is my third live stream. Alright, so again, here I am. I have my perfect grid, I have my walls, everything is being represented in a fantastic way. They all have random colors to them too, which is fine for now, I guess. Maybe later I want to make it so they all have uniform colors. So it looks a bit better than a weird disco ball. But then again, we are doing a 90s screensaver challenge, and what is more 90s than a bunch of random colors? Right before we go into late 90s and early 2000s, where everything is gray, dark, and emo, and then we can do a early 2000s black eyeliner challenge on Max MSP, but maybe that's not so fun as creating a screensaver. <clears throat> All right, anyway, so going back to the coding challenge, coding train video that I am uh, quote unquote being inspired from, well, in this video, there is actually a mention of this Wikipedia page, the maze, maze generation algorithm, which is what we want, right? So uh, I'm not going to read this entire thing, but it's really interesting and I do recommend you do read this if you're really into this stuff, but at the end we want something like this, right? And here's how we are going to do it. <clears throat> right, we are going to, uh, and I can actually read this part, we are going to consider the space for a maze uh, being a large grid of cells, like a large chessboard, this is where we are at right now, each cell starting with four walls, and starting from a random cell, the computer selects a random neighboring cell that has not yet been visited. The computer removes a wall between the two cells and marks the new cell as visited and then adds it to the stack to facilitate backtracking. Now that stack thing seems a bit complicated right now, we are going to get there, I'm skipping that for now, and the computer continues this process with a cell that has no unvisited neighbors being considered at that end. And when at the dead end it backtracks through the pad until it reaches a cell with an unvisited neighbor continuing the pad generation by visiting this new unvisited cell creating a new junction. This process continues until every cell has been visited causing the computer to backtrack all the way back to the beginning cell. We can be sure every cell is visited. Okay, now. How do we do this? Uh, well, first of all, we have a great suggestion from the chat to use the brick texture from Windows 95. That, that's a fantastic idea. I tried to find the brick texture from Windows 95. I could not find it, but I did find in the images folder, these guys here, right? I think these come built in with Max MSP. Let's see. There were some images here. There we go. There is this brick color map.jpg. Right, so, and the location of this on my computer is C74 Media Jitter, so if you have Max installed, which I hope you do if you're watching this, you should have this brick texture. So, yeah, let's, let's digress a bit, and before we go into that maze algorithm, let's make all of these guys look like bricks. So, as you might know, I can just drag this into here, which will create an fpig object, and if I bang this fpig object, I'm going to get a jitter matrix containing that image. Right, so here's a jitter matrix containing that image. These two look the same, but this is an fpig object and this is a jit p window. Now, uh, let's see, what is the best way of working with this? Mm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking out loud. Okay, let's work with textures. I'm going to create a jit gl texture. I'm going to use the name attribute to call this bricky. And then I'm going to send the jitter matrix containing this to this image into my JitGL texture. So now I can reference the bricky texture in my 3D objects and they're going to try to adapt that brick image, right? The texture that is contained inside my JitGL texture. Let's see, I wonder if it would work if I just define it in my original JitGL grid shape. So texture bricky. Yes, there we go. All right, so now all of these planes have this little brick texture. They're all no notice that they all still have those random colors, but it's kind of laid upon that texture image. So now this is significantly more Windows 95 than it was before. So I think we are succeeding at the 90s screensaver challenge, but now it's a 90s disco screensaver challenge. 
All right, back to the back to the maze algorithm. <clears throat> now, this maze algorithm I'm going to do in two parts, right? So the first part is actually implementing the algorithm. And then two is showing the algorithm on the 3D brick grid. So visualizing the algorithm and actually performing the algorithm are two different things. And as I've said, I'm going to start with the first one. <coughs> Excuse me. So what did it say? It said, consider the space for a maze being a large grid of cells, which is something we did, right? We have this jitter matrix, which is our grid for the maze, but I'm going to create a secondary JIT jitter matrix, right? I'm even going to give this jitter matrix a name. I'm going to call this, uh, I don't know, JIT dot, JIT matrix, JIT dot matrix. There we go, damn my dyslexia. And I'm going to give it the name grids, right? So I can reference this matrix with other objects or other jitter matrices. I want to give this a name. I want this to have a single plane. So each cell is going to have a single piece of data associated with it. It's going to have the float32 data type. And just like my visualization matrix, this is also going to be 10 by 10. And just like before, I can use the jit.cell block to visualize this. I can use, let's see, plane minus one. I actually don't need a plane minus one. I don't need to call it. I don't know why I'm doing this. It's it's a habit to try to enlarge the JIT cell block to display all values in a cell. But in this case, well, each cell has a single value associated with it. Now I am creating this secondary jitter matrix because this is the one I'm going to use for keeping track of visited and unvisited cells. And that's where I want to start, right? I want to create some kind of process where zero in a cell means that that cell has not been visited. And the value one means that that cell, well, it has been visited, right? So I can do something like, let's see, set cell zero, zero, val one. Sending this message to my JIT matrix is going to make it so that the cell with the coordinate zero, zero has the value of one. And this can be my starting point. And from here, I can try to conceptualize the ap application, the implementation of my maze generation algorithm. And here's what I want. I want this button to be the beginning of everything. So when I send a bang to this matrix, when this jitter matrix has been triggered, so it sends the jitter matrix from its outlet, I want something specific to happen. I want this jitter matrix to look around, more specifically look to the right, look up, look left, look down, and decide which cells are empty. Right, so are all of the cells around it empty? Or is there only a single cell to the right that is empty? And from those selection, from uh, those pool of available choices, I want it to randomly decide on a direction to go to. So let's say if I start here, well, I don't have anything to the left. I don't have anything to, if I go upwards, but if I go right and if I go down, well, I do have options here, right? I can go to the right or I can go down. And then I can, or my algorithm can try to figure out, you know, if it should go right or if it should go down based on random chance. Okay, now this is slightly tricky, but let's see how we can implement this. So I'm going to use JITGen again, right? Because I love using JITGen because it's really useful. As a very, very pro gamer said, it is so bad. And I'm going to open this JITGen and I'm going to use a very valuable operator inside this JITGen called sample picks. Right, and sample picks is going to take a matrix and it's going to, well, sample something from it based on the coordinates sent into the second inlet. Right, so, so the first inlet of sample picks decides which matrix to sample from and the second one is going to be the coordinates. Now sample picks works with cell coordinates, right? Uh, sample a matrix of the given coordinates with linear interpol interpolation. That's something we actually don't want, so let's see. I want nearest picks. Disregard everything I've said, my favorite operator is nearest picks, not sample picks. <clears throat> and again, this is going to receive coordinates, right? And it's going to receive cell coordinates 
meaning uh, it's not going to be values between 0 and 1, but in this case, in a 10 by 10 cell, it's going to be x and y coordinates that go from 0 until 9. And let's say we are starting with 0, 0, but the coordinates I'm sampling from, I want this to be a parameter, right? Because the sampling coordinate is going to be my current position, so it's something that needs to be updated. So I can declare this as a parameter, say param pause for position, 0, 0. So by default, this is 0, 0. And I can use this nearest fix to, let's see, I can use this to look around. I can use this to look at my neighbors. And how do I do this? Well, I create four instances of nearest picks, right? And let's do the same thing, uh, top neighbor, right neighbor, bottom neighbor, left neighbor, right? These can be the guys that we are looking at. And to figure this out, well, I just need to modify the coordinate I'm working with. So what do I need if I have a coordinate and I want to look one right? Well, I need to increment the x coordinate by one, right? So I can take my parameter, I can take my param pause zero, zero, and I can add one zero to it, right? So some nice vector maths here. So I'm taking my coordinate, I'm, I'm adding one on the x-axis, zero on the y-axis. So I'm kind of going one to the right. But uh, what did I say? I want to start with the top one, meaning that I should be, let's see, I should be adding 0, 1. No, I should be adding 0, minus 1 to look up. Then if I want to look right, as I've said, I need to add 1, 0. If I want to look down, I need to add 0, 1. And if I need to look left, I need to add minus 1, 0. So going one left on the x-axis. There is one more thing I need to do to make sure this works correctly, and that is the attribute bound mode, which determines what happens if I'm, let's say, on this cell, and I try to look left, and i am kind of reached a boundary. Is it going to kind of wrap around and look at this guy? I don't want this to happen. Is it going to fold around and kind of start mirroring whatever guys, uh, whichever cells are here? I don't want that to happen either or it can clamp, so it can kind of hit a wall here and just report me whatever value this cell has as I'm go trying to go to the left, you know, since there is no cell existing there. That is what I want to happen. And this is called the clamp bound mode. As in, if you try to go less than zero, you're going to get zero. If you're going to go higher than the max amount, you're going to get the max amount. If you're going to if you're trying to go less than the current cell, you're just going to get the current cell since there's a boundary here. And the same thing vertically, if I try to go up here, if I try to look at the cell that's uh, on, the, on top of this one, since that doesn't exist, it's just going to give me the values of the current cell. All right, so I just need to update all of these nearest picks objects with the bound mode clamp attributes. And I can also try to make it look a bit nicer, kind of change the size of these objects, right? Because presentation is important when you're patching, I think. If you make it look nice like this, it's easier to read, then you can share it with your friends and family. And if you're somehow a person who has friends and family that are also good at Max MSP, they can be impressed by your coding skills, by your patching skills, and more importantly, they can actually understand what you're trying to do without you having to tell them about it for five hours. Anyway, now, uh, I'm going to send the results of these guys from different outlets, right? So the top neighbor, the right neighbor, the bottom neighbor and the left neighbor are going to come out from here, right? And even though this is the output is going to be a 10 by 10 matrix, all of the cells are going to be, are all of the cells are going to have the exact same value, right? Let's, let's look for example. 
See, they all have one because in any case, I'm just asking the question. I have a cell at zero, zero. I'm trying to look up, what do I have? Well, I kind of hit the wall here. So it has the value of one. Then all the cells are going to give me the same answer. But if I look right, for instance, right? So I'm here, I'm looking to the right. Ah, it's zero, so it's unvisited. So it's unvisited, so it's zero. All of the cells have the same value. All right. Now, we need a way to turn all of those values into a singular float number, right? And we are going to do this, let's see, we are going to do this with a comparison operator, but, okay, okay, I'm going to gather my toss and I'm going to try to explain what I want to do. I want to give these neighbors eventually an identifier, identifying number, right? So I want to make it so top has the value of one, right has the value of two, bottom has the value of three, and left has the value of four, right? So these are going to be my options. And each time I bang this, eventually, I want to have a list containing some of these elements, right? So maybe a list has one, two, three, meaning that, ah, the, name, the cell I'm working with uh, has unvisited neighbors at the top, to the right, and to the bottom, but not to the left, since my list does not have the value 4. Or maybe I would have a list with uh, only 2 and 4, meaning that my right and left neighbors aren't visited, but my top and bottom ones are. So let's see how we can make this work. Let me just make sure the values are in the right space here. Okay, so first of all, I want to flip this around. So I want to make it so that if there is a neighbor, I want this jitter matrix to have the value of one. So I'm going to use jit dot equals equals. Right, jit equals equals and then at val zero. So I'm asking every and each matrix now, are you containing the value of zero? If so, give me one. If not, if you are wrong, give me zero. What this effectively does is it flips the value. There are other ways of doing this too, but I'm kind of just making things up as I go along, as long as it works, and this does work, so it kind of flips the value. And then I want to take this matrix and I kind of want to turn it into a floating number, into a flow num, so I'm going to use jit.spill, which will unroll the matrix into a list. Right, so if I do this, now all of these zeros, instead of being in jitter matrix form, well, it's just a message, it's just a very long list, containing the same value over and over and over again, which means I can just slice out the first element since, you know, that one is the same as all the other ones. All of these values are supposed to be the same. So I can use ZL slice one, all right? So slice me the first element here, and there we go. Now, this is zero. Why is this zero? Because again, this is the top neighbor of my current cell and Right now, there isn't anything there. I've hit the boundary. So is this zero? No, it's one, as in it's already occupied, or it's a border, but then I'm turning it into a zero. Again, a bit complicated, a bit nonsensical, but it is going to make sense because I want to do the same thing for all of these guys. All right, I can get rid of this. I want to do this here too. And let's look at the results. There we go. So now there is no top neighbor. There is a right neighbor that's empty. There is a bottom neighbor that's empty and there is no left neighbor that's empty. It's either already visited or it is a border. Now, what did I say? I want to turn these into some identifying numbers. One, two, three, four. So I can just multiply the results here by one or by two or by three, or by four. There we go. So this is the exact same thing, but now if I see the number two in this list of numbers, I immediately know, ah, there we go. There is a bottom cell that is unvisited, right? And no, wait, two is, there is a cell to the right that is unvisited. There is a uh, cell on the bottom that is unvisited, but the top and left ones do not exist. There is no cell that I can visit here. 
So if I filter out the zeros and if I group this into a list, I have a list that's representative of my possibilities. So let's use the route pass object here. Route, pa route pass is going to take in a message. It's going to see if the message starts with a certain value and it's going to pass it. The, it's going to pass the entire message if it is starting with that value. Meaning I can have route pass one and route pass two and route pass three and guess what route pass four, which is going to be connected to the result of my previous operation. All right, so now if I get zeros, route pass is not going to report it. Route pass is only going to pass the message if it does contain a non-zero value. Right, so now I, I do have my two and three, but my first and last elements are empty. They are not even receiving anything. Nothing is being sent from route pass one, which is great because then that means we can use ZL group to pack all of these into a list. Not ZL group, that doesn't mean anything. ZL group does mean something. And how does ZL group work? Well, we can send its lists to kind of pack into a list, or no, elements that we want to pack into a list, into the first inlet, and then if we send it a bank, after it receives those values, it is going to send those elements as a complete list. Which means I need to get into trigger business. I need to say TBB. I need to do things in a certain order. So I, when I start my process, when I click this button, I need to first bank this matrix so ZL group receives all the relevant index numbers. And after that is done, I need to send a second bank to ZL group so it sends out the lists. There we go. So now I have a list that says a uh, three and two. Right, so uh, this is already great. And this value is going to change, of course. For example, if I say that my position is not zero, zero, but I don't know, five and five, so kind of the middle of this jitter matrix I have, if I click this, I'm going to get four, three, two, one, as in all of the neighbors are available. But again, if I fix this, so if I change my position parameter to zero, zero, well, I'm going to get three and two, as in the right and the bottom neighbors are available. All right, now I want to set up a system where after I do this, I randomly pick one of the available steps, right? I have three and two, so I want to randomly either pick three or two. In another case, let's say I have four, three, two, one, then I want to randomly pick between four, three, two, or one. And how are we going to do this? Well, once we get this list, list, we can first determine its length, right? I can say ZL len. If I send a list to ZL len, what is it going to do? It's going to give me the length of that guy. And meanwhile, since we are running out of estates, real estate space, I can zoom out a lot. I can place a but button on the bottom right corner here. This is a trick I love doing. So I can kind of scroll as much as I want without the bottom of the screen giving out. Anyway, I got, okay, I got the length of my lists, right? So again, if I do this, ah, my, the length of the current list is two. Okay, so I want to generate a random value between zero and the length of my list, right? And you might know the second inlet of random is going to set the upper limit of my random generation. So if I send two, then random will either generate zero or one. So up to but not including two. If I have three elements in my list, then it's going to generate a random value of uh, zero or one or two or two, right? which means I can use the ZL lookup object. And ZL lookup is going to receive a number as an index value, and in its second inlet, it's going to expect a list. And then it's going to use an index number to look up that list, look up a certain element in that list. Meaning, this kind of setup will let me randomly pick one of the elements I thought so, it's not happening. Why? Because ZL group is not supposed to send its list into random. Random needs a button. It needs a button to trigger output. There we go. So now, boom, there we go. Now look at what's happening. Each time I click, I'm getting either a two or a three. 
2333322333 because my available options are 2 or 3 so this is essentially me deciding on a random direction to go that is not uh, you know that has not been visited before okay then how am i going to actually do the movements now this is going to be the tricky part i believe let's see so i want to use cell here select cell 0 1 2 3 Right, because I can have up to four options. And cell is going to give me banks based on whatever I receive. Let me see. All right, so in this case, if the first outlet sends out a bank, then there is a neighbor, then I've decided to go up. If the second one lights up, I've decided to go right. The third one, I've decided to go to the bottom. The last one, I've decided to go to the left. Right? And if I, as I'm clicking this, you can see only the last two are lighting up because I can either go to the right or to... Wait, there is something that doesn't make sense here. One, two, three, four. Okay. Ah, yes, of course. All right, so this is a bit goofy. Uh, the problem here is the fact that random gives me 0, 1, 2, 3, but I'm kind of working with this 1, 2, 3, 4 here. Um, but I can easily turn this into a 0, 1, 2, 3 system, I believe. Right, but that is also not going to work very well because then I'm not filtering out the zeros. If I receive a 0, I think... No, 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 wait. Okay, this, this should work. This should work. So if I multiply these values with 0, 1, 2, 3, and then I modify the route pass objects to, to recognize those new values, they should match up with these options here. Yes. Or are they matching up? Wait, so why am I getting two one zero now, even though my position is zero zero? Hmm, let me let me think about this real quick. Okay, this is all wrong. Yeah, uh, yeah. Suggestion from the chat is to add one, which does make sense. So let's just take back everything I have done, and the results. Wait. Oh no, what, what am I doing? Why do I have to start cell with 0, 1, 2, 3? I'm expecting 1, 2, 3, or 4. This is all wrong, this is all backwards. Okay, there we go. As, as much as I also allow, I also love zero indexed lists, I don't need it here. I only need uh, 1, 2, 3, 4. And there we go, now the right buttons are lighting up. So now only the second and third buttons are lighting up, meaning that I've either chosen to go right or I've chosen to go down and I never choose to go up or to the left because that is not an option where I am right now. Okay, good. Now we need to update our position according to our selection, right? So I am right now with zero, zero and let's say I am deciding to go to the cell to the right. So now I should be one, zero. And let's say then I am going down, then it should be 1, 1, then I'm deciding to go to the left, well, then it should be 0, 1, and so on. All right, so I need to have this list of two values that are constantly incrementing or decrementing. So, then what I'm going to do is to use an object that increments or decrements. This, this is, I think this is an obscure max MSP object. I don't know, I don't know if any of you have heard of ink deck increment and decrement a value, even as this nice little UI. And I can go to its help file to see what it exactly looks like. Right, so it increments or decrements a value, I can connect it like this, and then I can kind of use these arrow, I can click on these arrows, to either go up or go down, I can increment up or down. Or instead of doing this, I can just send it the message, ink or deck as an increment or decrement. And this is what we are going to use to keep track of our position. Right, so I'm going to have this number box here. 
And I think it works like this, if I remember right. Yes, I'm going to have two of these, and I'm going to start with the zero, zero position. Right, and I can increment it again, up or down. And I'm going to consider it in such a way that the left number is the x coordinates as I am traversing through these cells, right? So I'm at zero, zero, I can increment it by one, again, 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 and on the y-axis, I can do the same thing, increment it or decrement it to kind of move through these cells in my grid. Okay, now, the only thing I need to be careful about is the fact that I don't want it to go to minuses, right? So if, if it's at zero, it should stay at zero. If I decrement it, it shouldn't go to minus one, two, three, or four. It should just stay at zero. And the same thing, if I increment it farther than, let's say, nine, it should never arrive at 10 because there is no cell with the coordinate 10 in my 10 by 10 matrix. It only goes up to nine. It's from zero to nine. So to make sure of this, I can use the Pong object, which is like, it's a clipper, it's a range limiting object. I can give it the initial low and high values of 0 and 10, so it will go from 0 to 9 and not 10. And I can give it the mode clip. So when I am trying to go higher than 9, or if I'm trying to go lower than 0, it's just going to stay at 0 or 9. So here's what I will do. I will when I do this increment or decrement operation, I will, let's see, I am going to refresh the number, I am going to put it through Pong, and the result of that clipping is going to go back into my ink deck object. Hmm, let's see. Oh, this is a bit strange. So it does go below zero once, but I believe the result of Pong should still be the right one. Okay, so the refreshing value, the visualized value here is wrong, but Pong is sending out the right value. Though it is, it is working as intended, so it is going up to 10, but not higher than 10, so I can just give it the arguments zero and nine. There we go to make sure this works as I envision it. Let's see. Okay, so if you're considering these values right now, yep, it goes from zero to nine, and if I try to go higher than nine, it's saying, well, no, I'm not going to go higher than nine. And the same thing is happening, of course, on the y-axis as well. So these two values are our coordinates, and now we are able to increment or decrement them by one. All right, so now comes the fun parts. As I've said, instead of clicking on these, I can send the ink and deck messages, right? Now I just need to figure out which one of these bangs trigger which messages. All right, let me think about this. Um, now, one is top, so I want to go one higher than my current cell, and to go one up, I need to subtract one, if I understand this right. So this means decrement on the y-axis. The second one is to go to the right, meaning I need to increment on the x-axis. The third one is go to the bottom, which means I need to increment on the y-axis. And the last one is go left, which means I need to decrement on the, on the x-axis, yes. And if I reset these, I should receive the right value. Let's see, so I click this button, I've chosen to go right, so now my coordinates are one and zero. Instead of zero and zero, I get one and zero. Great. <laughs> well, we did. We did a very simple thing using this uh, semi-complex complex algorithm. So now I can take this and I can make sure the cell with those coordinates also have the value of one. And this is why I named my grid matrix in the first place at the very beginning. So I can create a jit.matrix matrix grid here and this is going to refer to the exact same matrix as this. So if I change something in one, the other will be changed as well. Right, and I can use the set cell message. So I can pack set cell 0, 0, val 1. 
and then the coordinates are going to be whatever this is. There's a pack zero zero. One of these changes, the position gets updated, and I want that cell to change. And I'm not only going to do this, but since I have this new coordinate here, I can also use that to refresh the position parameter in my JetGen, right? So I can refresh the position parameter. So next time I do this, next time I bang this button, I'm going to start from the position I have arrived at. So let's use a send object, send cell chords. So the new cell coordinates is being sent, receive cell chords. And I'm going to prepend this with pause. So it's, whoops, I don't know why that got deleted. So that it is going to update the parameter named pause with the new values. All right. Now comes a moment of truth to see if our algorithm works. Now we are looking here, we are starting from one and I'm going to bang this button. Okay, and we have gone down. I bang this again and we skipped two to the right. Okay, this did not work as I expected. So we did something wrong here because we went down and then we went right twice. And why is that the case? Two, one. Why, what happened here? Hmm. All right, we might need to do a little bit of bug fixing here. So let's reset everything. So I'm going to use clear comma set cell 0L1. So this goes back to normal. I'm going to set these to zero. And I am going to, let's see. Ah, okay, let's try this again. So I bang this and I'm going to the right. Right, so because this has sent the message one, so one zero and my new cell is one zero and that coordinate has been updated. And if I click this again, okay, I'm going one down because this has sent the value one, so now one one. If I do this again, I'm going to the left. Okay, so far so good. So maybe it's one of those cases where I did not change my algorithm, but it still works for some reason. I click it again, I go down, I click it again, I go to the right. I click it again, I go to the right. Okay, it seems to be working now for some reason. That is weird. Okay, and if, if you're good at visualizing things, if you're good at visualizing things, you might notice that this is kind of following this path, right, from the pool of available spaces around it. It's kind of like it's playing a game of snake. If I do this enough, I'm eventually going to arrive at a spot where it's stuck. In fact, I can even visualize this better, I think, by using a JIT P window. Let's try this. Okay. Um, I also have to reset these as well. Everything is reset. Ah, there we go. So this is what is happening. I'm kind of filling in the path here. See, so this is kind of the path my maze is taking. And of course, at some point, it gets stuck. But this is really good. This is really good because if we add this stack algorithm, if we add this stack way of thinking, we are actually kind of done. In fact, this is so useful, I'm going to do something else. I'm first going to go back to my 3D visuals and I'm going to start removing vaults according to this logic. <clears throat> All right. Now, removing vaults. Now, how does this work? I, I want something specific to happen, right? If, I'm, if I reset everything, let me reset everything here. And if I have my cells in this context, when I move from, what, what is happening? Why does it start from here now? My God. Ah, I know what the problem is, okay. It's, it's all about refreshing these position values here. Maybe later I'll do it in an easier way. Now I'm uh, doing it in this way. Ah, uh, Cameron in the chat says, now build Snake in Max. Uh, I, I guess I might digress a bit. Snake is already built into Max. If you go to Node for Max Overview, there is a Snake app that you can do. 
Right, so you can actually kind of play snake with the arrow keys if you want. And I think this works using the same logic. Kind of lose the game here. Yep, there we go. I, I can even die. And how does this work? Well, it's a note for Mac scripts. I, I can look at this. Well, why not look at it? While well, I'm at it. Just completely go off the rails here. Do something completely different. But there we go. If you're good with JavaScript, if you're good with Node.js, here's how we can here's how we can create Snake using MaxMSP. But of course, we can do this in a better way. Maybe in some other live stream, I'm, I create Snake in Max. Why why don't I do that? All right. But for now, yeah, yeah, okay. I I can yeah. Th that is correct. That is cheating. I can do it using all matrices. I will do that eventually. That's actually a very cool idea. But for now, I just want to finish doing this maze because, my god, it's already a very complex patch here, at least for my standards. Anyway, what was I saying? So as I'm traversing this, right, as I'm traversing, each step I take, I want to do something specific. Like, let's say I am on the space, right? So you, you might think there is no wall here, but that's actually because it's perfectly hidden because of the camera angle. Anyway, so I want to make it so when I go from here to here, I remove the right wall from where I began, and then after I move, I remove the left wall from the from my current position. Right. So when I do this movement, when I go from one position to the next, I remove the wall here, and I go here, I remove the wall to the left, and I want to apply this, of course, to each and every movement, which should remove the walls as I'm traversing through the maze. Okay, uh, how am I going to make this happen? All right, so, well, guess what? I'm going to create yet another jitter matrix. Hooray, I'm going to create a jit.matrix with four planes, well, let's call this a walls, with four planes, flow 32 data type and 10 by 10 yet again. Right, and I'm going to visualize this once again with jit.cell block. How is this going to work? Well, each plane here is going to refer to a different wall. Now, this is really important, right? Uh, and by default, I want all of these walls to be to refer to a different wall. I mean, I know, I want all these values to refer to a different wall. I'm thinking in walls so much that I can only think in terms of walls. Now, I want all of these values to refer to walls, to a specific wall, right? Let's say the first value refers to the top wall, and the second one to the right wall, the third one to the bottom, to the fourth one to the left. And if they are zero, it means there is no wall there. If it's one, it means there is a wall there. And by default, just like what we have here, there are walls everywhere. So I can use the message set all one. If I send this message set all one to the matrix, then all the cells and all the planes are filled with the value one. Okay, so this is my starting point, and now each time I take a step, I want to do two things. Right? I want to remove the wall, remove a wall from my current position, go to the next position, also remove a wall there. Which wall? Well, that depends on which direction I'm going to. So for this, I can format an important message. Uh, and that message is pack set cell 00, zero plane 0 val 0. Of course, these zeros are going to be replaced by stuff, right? And what do I do? Well, I need to determine two things. First of all, the cell coordinates. right? And that is something I am deciding already, right? I, I send the cell coordinates after I uh, decide on the next step. So apart from sending that cell coordinate here to my JIT gen, I can also send it to this message. So set cell, cell coordinates. And then zero, zero, plane, that's something I have to decide. And then value zero, right? So I'm going to say, take a cell in this specific coordinate, target the plane there, and set that value to zero. Now the question is which plane, and well, that's the, that is determined by the direction we are going to, right? And we have, in fact, four possibilities, zero or one 
or two or three. Right, and again, zero is top, one is right, two is bottom, three is left. But in any case, we're playing, they're all going to go in here. The thing is though, each time I trigger one of these buttons, as in each time I'm moving into a direction, I actually need to do this twice, right? First, before I move, and then after I move, which means things are going to get a bit complicated here. Because I need to essentially trigger three banks. So for each bank here, I need to trigger three banks. Why? Because when I trigger this, first, no matter the direction I'm going, I want to remove a wall in my current cell before I move somewhere. And let's see, so if I'm going up, that's the first option. In my current cell, I need to delete the top wall. That's zero. If I am going to the right, then I need to delete the right cell in my current cell. I mean, the right wall in my current cell. If I'm going down, the same thing. If I'm going left, the same thing. So after I do this, I actually change my coordinates. I trigger this whole incrementing, decrementing thing to figure out my next cell next cell position that is being sent to cell cord which is received by this message and after that I remove a wall in my current cell whoa all right so if I'm going up in my destination cell I have to remove the bottom wall right so that is two if I am going to the right in my destination cell I need to delete the left wall which is Three. If I'm going to the bottom, I need to delete the top wall in my destination cell, which is zero. And I believe if I'm going to the left, I need to delete the right wall in my target cell, uh, which is one. All right, so we are kind of going into spaghetti zone here, but this should technically work. Why is my, oh, there we go, my computer froze for a second. So I'm going to save this patch to make sure uh, nothing weird happens. But I hope the chat uh, and the live chat and live stream is all right. Okay, so I'm going to send this message to my jitter matrix. All right. Uh, let's see. And then while I'm doing all this, why don't I make sure that this message is already sent? Because pack will need either the first inlet to change an element or it will need a bank. So I can make sure each time I send one of these messages like 0, 1, 2, 3. I will send the bank here so the message is triggered and sent to my walls matrix. All right, now I'm going to use my walls matrix in this JITGL multiple setup I have. So we are kind of going back to the beginning. It's coming full circle now. We are almost there. All right, I'm going to create my JIT.walls. Which is that wall was it or was it walls? Yep, JIT. Not JIT.walls, JIT.matrix walls matrix also here this bang is also going to send it to these jit gen objects okay now i'm going to make sure the jit gen patches of each wall jitgl multiple has a second inlet and this inlet is going to determine the scale of the wall now this is the cool part right because if it is one it is normal size it's visible but if it's zero then it's invisible, then it does not exist, and then the wall is deleted. And for the top wall, well, we're going to look, in, look at the first element, the first plane. That's right, so I can use Swiss zero, look at plane number zero. And then I can go to my right wall, do the same thing, in two, Swiss one. Right, again, the scale. Then I'm going to go to my bottom wall, Paste the same thing. Swiss two is in take take the element with the index number two and let that determine the scale. And then the left wall is going to be Swiss three. All right, Swiss three. So now I have an inlet in the, I have a second inlet in all of these chip gen, and they can receive their data from my Vols jitter matrix.
And what is going to happen if I bang this? Okay. Apart from the random color generation, you can see all the walls are still here because everything is good for now. Now, all of these random colors are also kind of annoying me, so I'm going to give all of these guys a specific color. Right, so the, the floor can be white, and the walls can be purple, why not? Because I cannot afford to trigger random colors on each time because I want to bang this wall, bang this matrix as much as possible. Okay, this this looks horrible. <laughs> this looks much worse than I expected. Uh, it's a bit hard to see, but what the hell? Let's keep it like this. I changed my mind. This this looks good. This looks interesting. Anyway, so I'm now going to use this metric, the second outlet of JIT.world, to constantly trigger these matrices so it's constantly go through this process so when i update my jit matrix walls this is reflected here right so let's see if my algorithm is going to work all right so it is removing walls but it is not removing the right walls why is that? Ah, because, 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 because things are flipped here. Yes. Okay, so look at this. When I go down here, actually in my 3D visualization, I'm going up because the Y coordinates are flipped. Right, so each time I go up here, I need to revert the up, the top, and bottom cells. Right, okay. Okay, because the Y coordinates are inverted, I'm going to do a very hacky fix, but I'm going to turn one into zero. No, wait, I'm going to turn zero into two and two into zero. As in, instead of removing the top wall, remove the bottom wall. Instead of removing the bottom wall, remove the top wall. And I'm going to reset everything and try again. There we go. Now, as I traverse through this map, look at what happens. I'm getting this nice labyrinth shape. It's kind of going through the labyrinth, removing walls as it sees fit, and this is giving me a really, really nice-looking maze, but of course it gets stuck at a certain point. Right, so this is something we have to fix. Which brings me to the final part of this very, very, very long tutorial. I want to make sure I can step back. Right, so I want to make it, so let me think. I want to make it so I keep track of everything that is going on. And if I get stuck, I take a step back and I try again generating a random position. If that doesn't happen, I again take a step back all the way to the beginning. So since this has been a very long tutorial, I'm going to do, uh, do this fairly quickly. So I'm going to create a call steps this is going to keep track of the positions right and each time i am receiving a new coordinates i'm going to make sure by using change that if i repeat the same position it doesn't trigger anything and i only get new ones but pack is going to give me a position now i need two things i need an index number i'm going to use counter for this and i need to trigger first a bank right so the position goes here I increment my counter and then I send out the lists. And then I'm going to use join two. So I'm going to join those two in a list. But I'm going to make sure the second inlet is the trigger because the first one is going to be the result of counter, my index number. The second one is going to be the actual list. And this can go into my call steps. All right, so now I'm going to be keeping track of each move I make here. And then I need to make sure that I can kind of calculate if my, let me see, one, two, three, four, if I am at a state where I'm stuck, if there is nothing happening. And how can I do this? Well, I can look at the result of this operation, right, one or zero. And if all of these are zero, then I'm stuck. And how can I do this? I can add up the result of these ZL slices. Right, so 
head. But this goes from right to left, so first add these up, then take the results, and add this up, and then take the results, and add this up, and then check if this is zero. If it is, then we can trigger something with a bang where we take a step back. Now are we going to do this? Well, I'm going to trigger two banks here. Right, and the uh, I'm going to keep track of whatever my counter is doing, or whatever whichever number my counter is at. So int to the second inlet. So I'm kind of keeping track of the current index number, and I'm going to make sure that I trigger this int with my first bank, that I subtract one from it, so I take a step back, right, and. I also pack a message called delete, delete zero. But instead of zero, I'm going to give the index number and I'm going to trigger that message. So delete the current index number and then subtract one and make sure counter triggers that number on the next iteration. Right, so go one back and do the same thing. But um, is this going to be enough? Hmm. Nope, I also need to trigger the current step as well. Yep, so after I do this, I also need to kind of take out the second to last element here. I right? send this minus one right here, get the result and make sure that is a, let's say, sends current step. Right, that's going to be the current step now. And I think this is going to work because I'm going to get the current step here and I'm going to update my ink deck set here with those values. So receive current set, unpack zero, zero. And now those are my current elements. Okay, so we got a fairly complicated algorithm and because this is a very long live stream and a very long tutorial already, I'm not going to go into detail on how this works. All I will do is to kind of set everything to how it was before and see if this will work. So it went to get stuck. Yes, look at what's happening. It went to get stuck. It is backtracking. And you can see that eventually, once it's done backtracking, we do get a complete labyrinth as a result of this algorithm, just by removing a bunch of vaults. And again, I can do this once more, right? I'm going to reset everything first equal one my coordinates should be zero eventually i can just maybe create a button that does all of this but for now i need to clear my calls right clears that cell and do this once again And maybe instead of clicking it a million times, I can just use a metro 50 and then use a toggle to just trigger the entire process. Whoa, okay, and we ran into a problem here. What happened, my god? Hmm, it was going so well. Let's turn off this metro. I think the problem is that I didn't reset everything correctly, but I'm still going to just do this one more time. Ah, yes, the counter got stuck. We also need to make sure that we reset the counter, of course, right? Uh, which means I need to send it the message zero. So I need to reset the counter, my call, my current position. Um, I have to reset the vaults. I need to reset my grid matrix. And if I turn on the metro, is this going to work now? No, it's not working, oh no. Ah, we were so close to having a complete tutorial right here too. 
So we kind of have a have a vacuum matrix here. <laughs> hmm. What well, seems to be the problem in this case? Maybe there's an offset of something. Okay. Maybe it's about the order that I reset these things. So I reset my walls, right? I reset the counter, but then if I reset my coordinates, they're kind of incrementing the counter again. So after doing this, I'm going to reset the counter. Then I'm going to clear my call, and then I am going to clear this. What about now? Ah, so close yet so far. All right, but since this has been a long enough video, I'm going to call this what it is. Still a victory. Uh, maybe we have to figure something out with the outer walls, but the inner walls do work, and it does give us this nice maze labyrinth thingy, right? And of course, a uh, further step would be to actually traverse this labyrinth. Uh, with the current camera, this doesn't work, but you can look into using a secondary JetGL camera, right? How to position and rotate the camera in such a way that you are inside the labyrinth, you're inside the maze, and you can turn around and move and sometimes bump into the walls according to what you want to do. In any case, I'm going to take this patch and I'm going to place this uh, in the description of this video once it's done processing and once I upload everything so you can fiddle around with this yourselves. But just to go over the concepts, we looked at JetGL Multiple, we looked at JetGen, we looked at a maze generation algorithm implemented in here, and we kind of used a bunch of list processing objects to determine random steps, to increment or decrement our current position, and manipulate a bunch of matrices to create and visualize a grid of walls, to remove walls, to create a nice maze slash labyrinth. So here we are, this is the end of this live stream, a uh, fairly long and complex one, but I hope it has been fun for you, I hope you learned something from it, I hope you create something really cool from it, and thank you so much for watching.